responsible for Indigo Code Collective, which is our software uh, and app development uh, arm of the business. Um, today we're going to be talking about resilience and scalability, which kind of follows on a little bit from the last part of Rob's uh, little chat about what happens to WordPress when it gets busy. Um, I'll be talking about it from a, a more of a a software perspective uh, on the web rather than just talking about uh, websites. So uh, those kind of back-end systems that support uh, larger applications rather than just simple content delivery. Um, before I start, just a quick poll around the room. Who's aware of and has deployed or played with clusters of servers? Okay, a couple, that's okay. Your bit's probably towards the end. Um, who's been uh, involved in deploying things like the Linux servers, uh, the LAMP stack, things like that? Okay, a few more of you. And the rest of you, have you done any kind of HTML or basic website stuff? You yes, got. as well, yes. I mean, yeah. um, so, what I'll probably do is go, uh, the first part is really just a kind of history of how developers work their way up to uh, building systems that uh, deliver larger projects. So there's some pretty simple stuff to start with that should ease us through the process of uh, how you go from a simple website to something that has to be 24-7 scalable and reacts to large loads. Um, as always, before we start, uh, some caveats. Um, everything that we're going to talk about today is based on uh, open source technologies. Everything that we do at uh, Indigo uh, is based on an open source stack. Um, we love it. Uh, we haven't really done anything proprietary uh, for years. Um, everything's also based on my experience. Um, there are lots of different ways of cutting this. There's lots of different technologies that you can use. Um, so this is probably a relatively narrow view into the space, um, but it's stuff that I've done, so I know how to take a little bit. Um, this particular stuff that I'm talking about uh, is an active development project, an active phase. Um, so basically we're going to find out how well it performs later this year when the product launches. Um, but we're using approaches and technologies that um, are not totally mainstream, but they're definitely used uh, widely uh, out there. Um, your path to scalability and resilience is going to be different. Um, in di every project has some slight different nuances to it, um, different technology choices and things, um, but some of the general principles will probably uh, still apply. Um, so there's some questions that generally need to be answered when you're talking about this stuff. Um, so you've, you've got that great idea and you think it could be the next big thing. Um, so what is it really going to take to deliver that? Um, can you afford to build things small to start off with and worry about growing it later? You know, those kind of questions you generally have to answer. Um, what does that growth actually look like? Um, is it slow over time? Is it suddenly explosive? Um, a lot of those things will impact your choices that you make uh, when you come to build these kinds of systems. Um, the reality is you not often don't have a choice. You, you would generally build small and then react and, and build bigger later. If you're lucky to work on a well-funded project, you may be able to build these things in from the start, uh, which obviously makes a lot of uh, advantages further down the line with, with not having to kind of re-engineer things and replace things as you go along. Um, and, you know, some of the things that we'll talk about are those things that live behind the scenes. When you see these big, uh, big popular websites and applications, you know, generally the things that provide some kind of interactive service, you know, what are the systems that sit behind 
uh, that front end that you, you rarely get to see. Um, so the journey today we're going to talk about uh, is you know, the basics of the website, um, so those technology paths that uh, developers will take as they kind of learn their, their basic craft and uh, where you know, a lot of people operate um, and those first few steps as you build up through that technology. Um, we'll talk about different types of scalability, uh, so vertical and horizontal scaling. Um, there's a bit about ditching the scripts, which is what you do when you, uh, you know, what technologies go beyond things like PHP uh, and Ruby and Python and all those kind of interpreted and sort of uh, popular scripting type languages, what comes after that, what, what's more performant than that. Um, and we'll also talk a little, about, uh, a little bit about uh, a development approach, um, which is the monolith approach, which a lot of projects tend to default to, which is building all of your application into one big lump. Um, and how that affects potentially your scalability and resilience. So first steps is to look at um, the basics of constructing websites. You know, how do uh, people start doing this and how does that develop uh, as you go through? Um, and looking at the common steps uh, that a developer would go through is they tend to learn this kind of process uh, and depending on how good you are, where you stop uh, and uh, apply your trade. Generally speaking, you start with some kind of server, whether that's shared uh, space, it all ends up on a server, or whether it's a virtual server in a cloud, or in the olden days, actually a box under somebody's desk. Um, generally, it tends to be Linux these days. It's been discussed in other discussions today. Um, we use Linux. Uh, we tend to use uh, I'm a Red Hat fan, brought up on Red Hat, so we tend to use Central, <coughs> which is a white label version of that. But lots of other ones that can be uh, used, lots of different distributions depending on what you're using. Um, so the first, the first step towards delivering a website is you need some kind of web server to deliver it. Um, by far and away the most popular one for doing that is Apache. Um, there's lots of other ones, Nginx and IIS, they're, they're all basically do the same kind of, kind of job. Um, so your first website, effectively, is as simple as this. It's got your server, your web server that sits on the top, which is the bit that actually delivers it, and some basic hard-coded web pages. And that'll be pretty much where, where everybody as a developer would start. Now, this is really not resilient, because if this breaks, well, you're kind of screwed and your website's down. It's got limited scalability because there's not much you can do to just that single server and it's got static pages which obviously is quite limiting in what you can do with your actual product. Um, what it is though is very fast generally because static delivery is very fast uh, which means that with limited resources you can get relatively good concurrency so you can get you know, quite a lot of people looking at those uh, simple pages. Stage two of that, we still use some of the same building components. Um, you still have your web server and your basic server, but you then throw in that scripting language. So that starts to give you more facilities to develop with. Um, you've still got your HTML and CSS, obviously. Um, but that will be constructed using some kind of scripting language. Um, we've still got no resilience, um, and your scalability is the same. Fairly static depending on how good your scripting is, um, but you're starting to add that dynamic layer into it. Uh, it's still fairly fast because, well, it's not very complicated yet, um, but your concurrency is going to suffer a little bit because obviously your scripting language is going to start taking resource. And as soon as you start taking resource away, the amount of people that can view your site is going to drop because you're spending more time working out what they're going to be looking at. Um, lots of different script languages that can be used. Um, PHP is probably the most widely used. Um, Perl used to be um, back in the day, but it's less, less used now. Stage three is where well, you've got a bit of dynamic in there. You need to get a bit more complicated so you have a database behind. So you start storing some of your content in the database that is then put together and constructed to use your more complex uh, scripts to deliver more dynamic and complex pages. But again, lots of different types of database. Um, MySQL probably 
one of the most widely used, although MongoDB is becoming very popular, um, fashionable, depending on how you look at it. Um, still got the same problems, however, we've got some more coming in here because you're starting to slow your site down. Um, a database is going to take even more resources of your server, so that's again, has those same impacts, it's going to slow things down. Uh, you've got less to work with. You've got a lot of dynamic capability now with the database. You can do lots of things, so it's that kind of trade-off. The more flexibility and uh, dynamic nature you add into it, the more it costs from your hardware and your uh, delivery, your limited resource. And with that extra resource that's being used, of course, your concurrency is going down. So we're starting to hit some barriers now because we've got um, a really quite a nice ecosystem going there. We've got some, some good tools to be able to build complex solutions, um, but we're starting to hit some problems. Um, your concurrency is an issue now. You can only get a few users onto your website because it's basically not very big um, in terms of your infrastructure, um, but what you're trying to do is relatively complex, so you, you're resource limited. Um, you're making your websites probably more dynamic and uh, more engaging for your users, which is obviously um, using those uh, resources, which is again contributing to making it slower. Um, and script languages are inefficient or focus. Um, there, in coding terms, there's a couple of different ways of splitting up that that uh, delivery. Every time somebody asks for a page from your website. Um, something's got to answer it. And there's a couple of different ways of doing that. Uh, one way is where you fork the process. So your web server literally copies itself into a new process with all of its resources and all of its uh, required memory chunks and bits and pieces, uh, and then goes off and answers the request. And that's obviously quite expensive. It's time consuming, so there's time involved in doing that. Um, there's things that you can do to reduce that by pre-forking. Obviously, if you pre-fork, you're using lots of resource to do it. Um, and as soon as you finish that request, it may process a few requests, but after a while, it generally goes away. <coughs> Even going away takes resource. So it's quite a complicated process, and it's not terribly efficient. The other way is, is called threading, where you stay within the same process, and you get to share quite a lot of um, resources much much quicker uh, it's much more efficient on uh, resource um, so you get more bang for your buck the problem with scripting languages is that they generally don't play nice with threads so PHP is very very rarely used in a threaded environment because it just doesn't like it um, so you generally find that PHP is, is, is deployed with a forking model um, which is obviously quite expensive um, so the question is, what do you do next? Um, do you just throw a resource at it? Do you just make things bigger? Do you, do you um, scale up in that sense? Um, you've obviously performance tuned what you've got already. You've looked at the code, you've looked at your servers, you've tuned the, the Jesus out of it to get that last uh, little bit. Um, but it's still a problem, you're on one server. So the next set, the, ne the next thing you do is you actually start now to look at actual scaling, actual um, what you do to make things bigger. And this is where we come into those two different types of scaling, which is your verticals and your horizontals. Um, so the first thing is to explain the difference between those uh, two types of scaling. So we've got vertical scaling, which in a, a very simple sense is you just literally <coughs> make it bigger. So you take your small server and you re-engineer it into a bigger server. So this is very easy with cloud services. So you go onto your Amazons and your rack spaces and uh, whatever other cloud services that you use and there is nearly always an option to, to, <coughs> to resize your server. So you may well start with their base model which is half a gig of RAM and 20 gig of disk space or whatever. Um, one CPU, there's always an option where you can basically just make that bigger. And that can go up to quite significant sizes. Uh, if you look at some of the scaling on Amazon Web Services and you're talking 
uh, well into the tens of CPUs and hundreds of gigabytes of RAM, um, which is great because it gives you a very simple and, and easy route to making something go faster. More CPUs, more memory, generally will make it go faster. <coughs> the other option um, is horizontal scaling, because what happens when on your particular service you've hit that limit, you've got as many CPUs as they'll let you have, you've got as much memory as they'll let you have, but still you need something bigger. And this is where horizontal scaling comes in. And that is, you copy it you literally have more servers doing your workload. They will be pretty much identical, they'll be copies of each other, generally speaking, and they will do the same job. So now, each one of these will be able to deliver a known amount of um, requests for your website, and you'll be able to deliver more. What will probably happen is you're probably going to go for the vertical option first because it's the easiest. Um, it's most nine times out of ten, it will just be press a button in your cloud service, um, and anywhere from five minutes to a few hours later, your website or your application will be running on a bigger server. So if we go back to what we were using for our our site or application, you've got your web server and scripting language, which generally are going to hit your memory and CPU. You've got your database, which is going to probably hit all of those, but mostly your memory and your, your I.O. as it's doing its job. Um, and as I've said, you probably start off with something along those lines because it's the cheapest, and most projects start pretty cheap. Um, and then you might jump yourself up ultimately to something that's a little bit bigger, four CPUs and eight gigabytes of RAM. It's fairly typical. Um, but with that kind of technology stack, what are you expecting in terms of delivery? From our experience with this kind of stack, depending on what content management system you're using and how you've coded it and things like that and how dynamic it is um, without going to too many lengths, one to ten concurrent users is fairly common unless you get pretty clever. Um, obviously you've scaled up a bit, so you can get quite a lot more out of it. Um, it depends on how you start tuning these things as to how good that uplift is. Um, more CPUs, more, more RAM doesn't automatically give you what you would expect as a linear progression in terms of capabilities. You will have to look at how these systems are being configured and how they're they're using those resources to make sure that you're getting the most out of it. Um, but um, again, fairly conservative figures on that type of system for a complex, dynamic website. Um, still got those same old problems. We haven't got any resilience. Um, our scalability is limited by whatever cloud service provider you're using. Um, average to slow, well we're making it quicker because we're making it bigger and obviously we've still got all of that dynamic capability because we've got nice scripting languages and databases in there so we can do quite good things with our application. Um, once you get beyond that, you obviously go back to your horizontal and horizontal is going to start with the splits. Your first step where you, you start your horizontal scaling is going to be to take that database out. These two do not like being on the same machine because they basically crave the same resources um, and they conflict with each other. So they're both trying to grab all of the same things at the same time. Um, so getting those two things onto two different boxes, generally speaking, will have a really good impact on, on your performance because you're allowing, you can then tune each one of these boxes specifically for the needs of those particular applications. Um, again, we're still not resilient because either one of these now falls down and probably now you've got two of them, there's twice as much chance that one of them is going to break. Um, we're slightly better on scalability because we've now got more headroom because we can scale these two things independently. So um, we're getting better, we can deliver more. Um, and our concurrency has obviously gone up because now this is able to perform a little bit better because it's not conflicting with the, the database. 
this can be doing things whilst the database is really busy, so you're starting to be able to process more things. Um, we can split those resources quite nicely as well, so we don't have to necessarily just pay up more, but by splitting them, we're able to get more concurrent users and therefore deliver more pages. After that, we broaden that horizon. So, you know, we've split the database off, we've got our PHP and HTML. Um, the next thing is, well, let's actually put a little bit more on the front because the database, you know, they're pretty efficient, they, they can do quite a lot, but they're not where most of the work is being done. There's lots of heavy lifting being done here in servicing all of your, running your scripts and getting the pages out, and those don't always require the database. Mm -hmm. And especially if you've done it right, they don't always require the database. So if you're getting to the limits of the single configuration, you split the <coughs> So we've got slightly better resilience now, uh, which is the first time we've hit that, because obviously if one of these goes down, we've still got the ability to deliver our website or our application to people. So um, we're actually starting to get a little bit better. We've got better scalability now because We've got three areas that we can start scaling up, or four, depending on how many of these you put on the front end. Um, we've got some problems, though. Um, we've now got two web servers on the front side of this uh, application, so we've got the question, you know, how do you get the users to the web server? You've got two of them, but generally you've got one web address. So how do you get the load shared across those? Um, if you've got a complex application going, you've probably got some kind of user session, you know, storing their basket or their configuration of the view that they're looking at or whatever it might be. So if you're sharing the load across those, how do you share the, the sessions across the two machines? How do they coordinate things? Also, you've got to think about how you're getting your application onto these servers. If you're copying them and making lots of them, how do you get your code onto these servers? And then how do you keep it in synchronization? so that when you make your updates, you've got the same code running on each server. We've now got a problem because we've now got three machines here, so we're going to have to start upping our maintenance as well. So you've got to be doing all of that security patching or you're paying somebody to do it for you. Um, and we've still got a single point of failure because if our database falls over, nothing works. So you've got to start considering things like that. Um, so we need to start adding some extra things in here to make it, make it work. So we need some kind of balancer uh, that sits in front of that, uh, that application stack um, that's going to do that distribution. And that can do load sharing. It can do what's called sticky sessions. So once you come through the system and choose a server, you would stay with that server, which can help with some of your session management. Um, or you can load balance, or you can hot fail over. There's lots of options once you've got that balancer in the front. We can put a session cache in on each of the servers, which helps us to coordinate that um, transfer of live information about that user session, so what my basket is. So if this server for some reason disappears, well, it doesn't matter because I'll then just use this one and it's got all of my information on it anyway. So that seamless experience for your users is there. Um, single point failure, well we can kind of deal with that because we can put uh, what's called a slave database in, which is going to sit there in the, in the background and uh, everything that your master database does ends up as a copy on your slave database. So if something happens to the master, you can bring the slave database in and you can keep running. That transfer process in can be a little bit tricky depending on how uh, you manage it, and there are much better solutions than Master Slave um, out there that would give you much more seamless transfer. But that's probably the easiest configuration to set up if you're rolling your own. Um, so we've added some solutions here. We've got um, DNS round robining is a pretty rubbish solution, but it would work. Um, you've got a balancer, which is much better, and a lot of the cloud platform providers will provide you with a cloud balancer that will do that job for you. So um, there's lots of solutions out there that mean you don't have to necessarily do it yourself. Um, caching, there's lots of caching solutions out there, um, depending on which scripting language you're using. 
uh, will probably dictate which ones you'll use and depending on what type of application, but that's more of a, a software issue. Um, and we've obviously introduced some more problems as we've solved some of the other ones because we've got even more maintenance now because we've got to look after balancers, we've got cache systems that probably need monitoring to make sure that they're effective. Um, we've got a slave database which is relatively tricky, that's going to give you some headaches at some point. Your costs going up as well because obviously you're having to deploy more things um, and your complexity is going up. And these are mostly unavoidable. The bigger you get, the more complex these things are going to be because you have to serve a much bigger audience. However, we've now got much better resilience um, because we've got no single points of failure. Uh, so if we take out a web server, it's still going to work. If we take out a database, there's a solution for that. Um, we can manage more concurrent users because obviously we can scale all of these things independently uh, and you know, we can add more. So. We've, we've kind of got past that initial barrier of it's limited to that one box. So now we've got an opportunity that we can grow. So growth is a possibility now. But the costs are getting up. It's not, uh, it's not great. So you better have a pretty good application that's making you money because it's going to cost you. Um, so this gets you a long way. There's no doubt about that. Um, but at some point, you need to, you're going to start looking at areas that you can increase your efficiency. You can, you're going to start looking at areas where you can improve things, take advantage of some of those things we talked about earlier, which is things like the threading model to make better use of uh, resources. Um, and one of the ways of doing that is to get rid of that PHP or Perl or whatever it is. Um, so we've got some issues um, which are up for arguing. Um, I'm sure Rob will argue with me about it later. Um, scripts are interpreted, they, they kind of, they're not compiled, <coughs> kind of a bit liberal with the truth there, because generally speaking they'll be compiled at some point and maybe cached, but there's always the possibility that they'll just get recompiled again, or you, it's, it's not as great as it sounds. Um, they generally speaking don't have brilliant memory management, so if you're, you're talking about having to manage large volumes of data in your calculations, your application does complex things with big data sets, they're generally not great at handling that, um, that memory um, and lots of information is going to get thrown away with each, with each generation of uh, the page, uh, depending on how you've tuned that. Uh, and as we've said, they're generally going to be running under some kind of forked model. Um, as I said, there's always a different way. Um, and that forking, you can deal with that in some respects by having calls of pre-running Perl, Perl pre-running Perl, uh, pre-running PHP <coughs> executables that sit there and just answer your requests, so they're not really part of the, the page request, but you're starting to get really complicated with PHP then, um, and that introduces some other uh, issues to deal with. But there's always a way. However, I, we tend to go with a slightly different approach because we're slightly different developers, so we use uh, a compiled language. We prefer to use uh, something more like Java, uh, which is JVM based, which generally speaking will be uh, pre-compiled into something that uh, will run on a virtual machine. Uh, we can leverage that threaded model rather than forking um, and we would put that code into what's called a container which helps us to manage resources and share resources much better. Um, there's lots of different containers to fit that model, it depends on how you want to code, there's loads of choice. Um, some of the well-known ones, Tomcat, Glassfish, Jetty, uh, they, they all provide similar functionality uh, depending on what your needs are. Uh, and this all ends up to basically programming application servers, um, which you can do with Microsoft, but well, we don't talk about that. Um, so what is an application server? Because it's going to be the building blocks of our more advanced architecture. Um, we start with our server again, CentOS, that's what we use. Uh, 
you have a Java virtual machine running. So you've got a virtual server with a virtual machine running on it. Um, Oracle, JDK, OpenJDK, there's, there's lots of different versions of it. Uh, they're all derived from an open source uh, background. Um, there's paid versions of it as well, uh, depending on what's been tuned for your particular uh, requirements. Um, on top of that, Java Virtual Machine, you will run your container, the bit that you're going to put your code into. Um, we have in the past used Glassfish because it's open source and it was free. Um, however, Oracle have done dirty on everybody and have effectively discontinued uh, the development, or rather, they've discontinued the commercial support for that project and it's just um, open source now. Um, so we always tend to try and use something that's backed by some kind of company for support. Um, so we would probably go with uh, Wildfly, which is backed by Red Hat, um, which used to be JBoss. <coughs> so into that container, you put your application. So this is what the PHP scripts and the HTML and the database access was before. Um, so that goes and that's deployed using an enterprise archive or a web archive and it all gets dumped into that uh, container uh, and you get your presentation layout which is kind of the HTML, you get your Java beans which is your PHP script um, and you get your persistence which is the bit that talks to the database. So it's similar but a little bit more complicated. So that's what your application server is and that's what we'll probably use as the, the basis of our um, more complex architecture. Um, covering quite a lot of different bits here, which are uh, well, very complex in their own right, but Java Enterprise Edition containers, um, they're essentially there to make your life easier. They provide access to services that your code might need. Um, and they do all the co coordination of that, um, and they provide uh, easy access to it so that you don't have to basically write it yourself. Um, but they do tend to be uh, quite heavyweight uh, and complicated because of that. Um, but it's a comprehensive. And they favour this idea of putting everything into one big application um, so you deploy it in one big go, so it's that monolithic approach to software development. So, what's a monolith? other than a big black thing. Um, it's that kind of single app, single project approach to solving a problem. Uh, one code base, generally speaking, one project grows over time, you start at the beginning and it kind of grows and you add new features and you um, kind of changes and adapts, but you generally have to deploy it all in one go because it's one big lump of code. Um, it gets more complicated, the bigger it gets, it gets more difficult to manage, you end up with thousands of source code files and um, you lose a developer here or there and you know, they <coughs> documented some of it and it all ends up being a bit of a mess. Um, and it gets worse the more time goes on. And you generally end up being tied to decisions you made right at the beginning of the project. So if you choose a framework at the beginning under the monolith idea, you probably end up stuck with that decision from the start because everything's built on top of those earlier decisions and it's quite difficult to change those uh, and adapt later on without quite heavy costs. Um, containers love the monolith, one enterprise archive to all and all, it's, it's just easy, it's the way they do things. It's not terribly efficient for scaling either because effectively you're scaling your entire application in one go, you've, you've got no choice. Um, so, by using this alternate approach with giving us threads and compiled code and things, how does that change our uh, architecture if we start putting it together again? It probably looks relatively the same because we've not really changed much on the architecture, we've just changed <coughs> the approach that we're using from the software side of things which is making us use our resources a little bit more efficiently. Um, this is effectively our balancer at the top. Now we can do that ourselves now because we've got some things to play with. Um, we've got a Tomcat container. I've changed the diagram a little bit because it didn't work with boxes in boxes. Um, we've got our application, 
we're actually using Spring rather than Enterprise Java because it's lighter weight. Um, we've got our JVM still, so that's the equivalent to our web server, HTML and PHP and database. Mod JK is quite a nice little piece of kit that talks to Tomcat and understands how to balance between the two, so it knows when they're there, when they're not, how to distribute the code between them. Tomcat itself provides some of the facilities that we were lacking before, session replication, code replication, because in a cluster it's able to distribute your code for you. Um, so that solves one of the problems we had before. Um, and, well, we'll use a MySQL database that's in the cloud, because that takes some of the maintenance away from us, um, which does make things a little bit easier. So. We've simplified things a bit from that big kind of monolithic idea of glassfish and enterprise and heavyweight. We've got our threaded execution, we've got better memory management because we're using a, a JVM and compiled code. We've got our managed sessions now, we've got code replication which is starting to make things all work better. Uh, we're getting more bang for our buck because while well, we're using our resources more efficiently um, and we're not using EJP because that it's complicated. Uh, we learned that the hard way. But we've still got some problems. Containers are tricky. Um, even Tomcat is quite tricky to get working right sometimes. Um, Java requires a more disciplined development approach. Um, PHP and scripting languages and those easy entry don't require quite as much strictness. It becomes a discipline issue from the developer's perspective and not all developers are particularly disciplined. Um, Java and the likes of those types of languages will require you to be a little bit more uh, strict in your development and using these systems properly will guide you down that uh, development cycle a little bit uh, more closely. The containers are tricky, clusters are even more tricky because they've got things like synchronization issues to worry about, but if you've got a relatively straightforward uh, clustering system like Tomcat, it is relatively easy to get going and it just kind of works in the background on its own, you don't have to worry about it too much. Um, cloud databases are a bit of a trade-off. Um, they take all the heavy lifting, all of the hard work away from setting up and managing resilient databases, but by taking all of that work away from you, they also have to limit what you can do with them. So your tuning capabilities, your ability to make this work exactly how you want it to work is restricted. So you have to be a little bit careful about using those in your, your scaling and your resilience because at some point it may have a knock-on effect on your application because it's just not efficient enough, it's not doing things the way you need them to do and that cloud database is not going to let you uh, configure it uh, to do what you want. So we've kind of still got this monolithic approach, um, we're scaling things all in one go, you know we want to make this scale out, we're, we're basically copying this entire stack, which is our entire application, we're copying and deploying and that might not be the right thing to do. This has given us scalability, we've got our horizontal and vertical, we've got our cluster code, we've got reasonable efficiency, we've got reasonable resilience. If we want to deploy our application or update it, we've got a bit of a problem because it's going to cause us some downtime, because you change one, you've got to pretty much change them all because they're all clustered and whilst it's doing that it's going to take time so you're going to have downtime whilst you're uh, up doing your updates and if your site's under heavy development and uh, frequent updates that can get to be a bit of a problem. Um, it's the monolithic approach. Um, but it can handle pretty big loads. Um, you know you can go a long way with this kind of stuff and it can, it can deliver a lot of scalability for you. But what we'd really like is to be able to put the resource where we need it. So there may be small parts of this application that are particularly resource hungry and it'd be really nice to be able to feed those rather than having to worry about having to give it to everything. 
Um, we also, as we're getting this busy, it means we've got more people accessing our applications or our sites, and they're going to get hacked off with us updating and bringing the site down to put those updates. So we'd really like to be able to update the, the, the application with as little downtime as possible. Um, obviously, we're developing our websites and our applications continually, because that's how we keep our audience and how we uh, grow that uh, user space. So we need to be able to add new features. And if you're doing that with a monolithic approach, you're having to replace your application every time. You're having to do that deployment every time. You're having to integrate new code into an existing code base, which has lots of regression testing and all of those kind of things. So you probably don't want to be doing that kind of thing too much. Um, and also, we're, we're kind of stuck with what we've got here. We've still got that. We've chosen to use Spring, so we're kind of stuck with it. Um, we're stuck with Tomcat because that's what we're de deploying across. Um, so we, we'd love to be able to use other technologies as things move on, as new um, new products come to light, new projects come to light. It'd be nice to be able to integrate those really easily without having to disrupt everything else that we've done because they may actually help us to, to do better things and to uh, scale our systems uh, and offer better services. So there's a different way of doing it, um, which is microservices and asynchronicity, which is all about breaking the system down into smaller parts. And sometimes, depending on your, your buy-in to how micro micro is, that can be really, really small parts. So it might be down to um, taking and creating a service just about storing a postal address in your application, and that could be a whole service in its own right. Um, we tend to not go quite down that small when we're doing uh, this approach, but what you can do then is make each of those small parts that you've broken down, so you take your big application, you break it into small parts, and then you make those small parts <coughs> um, using simple solutions. You don't have to be particularly complex then because it's just about a very small part of your application. Um, what's important with a, micro, a microservice architecture is to make sure that your microservices really only think about and deal with the bits that they need to worry about. They don't need to know about everybody else, they just need to care about their small part of the puzzle. Um, and then you allow each of those microservices to talk to each other to be able to provide your application as it was in that kind of overall monolithic view. So you break it into small parts, make the small parts talk to each other, and the small parts deliver more than the whole, as they say. Um, the other thing you can do then, when you've got small different services working, you can make those services work at their own pace. So if you've got something that needs to be done, but it doesn't really need to be done right now, then you can offload it to that small service that's going to do it on its own at its own pace, which means you might be able to get back to your user quicker with a quicker page response, with a quicker answer, because part of your process that up until now had to be all done in one go can now be pushed off to the side and done at a later time, which helps to also smooth out big peaks in traffic and things like that, so that you know the heavy lifting might be able to be done in slower times during the day when uh, you've not necessarily got as many users. So the question is, what does that look like compared to our old architecture? So if you look at it from the front side of things, what we've probably got is a website at the front, and it's going to talk to our application. Um, when you talk about delivering applications to websites, you talk about application programming interfaces, API posts, so your REST interfaces and things like that. So you turn your application into an API that your website can then talk to, to deliver its services. We're still using those same technologies, we've still got Tomcat and JVM and we can do our container replication and all that kind of stuff. But now we take essentially the requests for information from our website and we push them onto a message bus. So we can basically go Here's a nice little request for information. We'll turn it into a message and we'll just throw it onto a message bus that 
it's going to then pass it on to our microservices. So we've talked about the APIs, this message bus, there's whole technologies um, to deal with passing messages around, which is an open protocol, the uh, advanced messaging queuing protocol, can you remember that, um, which handles delivery of those messages in a, in a reliable and resilient way. Um, and this message bus is obviously, it's still got to be clustered, it's still got to be scalable, it's still got to be resilient. Um, there's platforms to do things like that, RabbitMQ, ActiveMQ, and lots of others. Now that message comes in from the front end, from your website, through your API, across the message bus, and through some magic routing and bits and pieces, it's going to end up coming to one of your microservices. So you can see we've got service A, which deals with whatever it deals with, see service A questions. It's got its own database store. Um, and it only deals with its own database store, it only deals with its own information. So, message comes in, it's filtered to the right service. One of these is going to pick up a message, it's all done sequentially, so your distribution is automatically managed because each message is dealt with by one server. Um, processes what it needs to process and then pushes an answer back onto the bus which ends up back at your API, which ends up back at your uh, website. One of the things we said earlier on was that each service needs to only deal with its own piece of uh, the puzzle, uh, which is all about data it holds, generally speaking, and the process it does on that data, um, which is obviously resilient. Um, and it's very, very important, this, this architecture, is that you don't share that database with somebody else. You don't let another service talk to your database because that can cause you problems. Your services, each one can scale independently and be clustered as they go along. Um, so you can put the resources where they need to be now. So you don't need to spend money scaling bits that don't need to be scaled. So if service B is particularly heavily utilised in your system, well you scale that bit, you don't need to worry about scaling this bit particularly. So you can be much more efficient in where you're putting your, pro your uh, process. And you can add new services as you need because this doesn't know about this, they don't, they don't know each other exists, they just know that there are things out there that will provide answers to me if I ask questions. Um, and if I push information out there, then somebody might do something with it. So it's a collaborative way of uh, delivering a service without tying all your pieces together. Now this means that you can put new services in without actually doing anything with these. You don't have to worry about your new code breaking this code. As long as you follow rules about how messages are formatted and things like that, these things just get on with doing their job. So you can add new features and new services without actually impacting on your running system. So the question is, what does this look like when you put it all together? Um, and you start to get a much bigger system. So as I said, we've got that front end website, which actually is probably still going to be scaled in very similar ways but it's going to be doing far less work, so you can get much more out of what you're, you're doing at the front end. And it may well still be written with PHP. You know, technology choices are completely open at this point. So, But your HTML, your CSS, and all of your front end stuff's going to sit up there. It's going to ask for the services that it needs to deliver your application. <coughs> so it comes in via this API layer, which is turning what this asks for into messages that will be answered by who knows which service. Your messages transit across your little bus, get answered by the services, and then answers come back up. And it may be that there's more than one answer, because there may be more things that need to be done depending on what you're asking for. So there's that opportunity to have lots of things, lots of answers come back depending on what you're asking for. It's not a small deployment at all. It takes quite a lot of infrastructure to get that going, um, so you can't start this small. So if you're going to go for something like this, 
this can grow pretty big. Each of these can be scaled. Your message bus, there's options to make that take things like 250,000 messages a second throughput. Um, LinkedIn use this architecture uh, for their service and they've open sourced their solution to this particular problem, <coughs> um, which I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head. Kafka. Kafka, Kafka isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Um, and you know, 250,000 messages <coughs> in and out a second is a hell of a lot. That's, that's quite significant. Um, so, what have we got now? We've got massive scalability that we can configure where we need it. Um, we've got resilience in every single part of the system. There's no single point of failure anywhere. We've got versionable code deployment because <coughs> you have a service that provides a particular function um, and because the way of uh, writing the application is each message type is versioned, you can introduce a new version of that service which answers a new version of the question which you can run in parallel with the old version. So you can have an old version of your website talking to the old service with a new version of your website talking to the new version of the service at the same time without impacting on either. So your ability to roll out new services to parts of or all of your user base suddenly become possible because you can actually do things like that, you know, versioning your code. Um, you've got a choice of technologies now. Um, each of those services is completely independent. As long as you've got a library that allows you to talk your language onto the bus, you can write those services in whatever you like. The only thing they need to be able to do is integrate with the AMPQ, the messaging process. So they can be written by anybody in whatever language you like. So you can have a mix of C Sharp, you can have Python, you can have Ruby, you can have Java, uh, whatever, you know, Node, it doesn't matter. You've then got, you're opening up the pool of developers that you can work with then, because if you've got a really talented node developer and you want them to work on this system, well that's great, let them write their services in node, it doesn't matter. Your core is now even language agnostic. Um, it's also now plug and play, because you can add new features as you need without actually impacting on any of your old code. You don't have to regression test services that are running. As long as you adhere to the rules that you set on your message format, you don't have to worry about a particular service breaking another service. So you, introducing new features becomes a much easier process. Um, which addresses that issue of being able to keep updating your service without interrupting. Now obviously if you talk about your LinkedIn's and your big uh, big players, they can't take their service down to introduce a new feature. They just can't, it's death to their, their business model. So they have to find solutions to, be able to introduce new features, new code, without having to impact the whole thing. It's not all great though, there are still problems. Um, obviously, the biggest one is latency, um, because it takes time for your request to get from the top of that stack to the bottom of the stack and back again, and all of the time it takes to do your actual processing of work. So you have to be able to adapt your application to cope with that latency. Um, it's not much. Um, in the testing that we've done, we're adding maybe 200 milliseconds. Um, but as the load goes up on the platform, that latency can increase, so it becomes vital um, that you monitor what's going on on your system so that you can <coughs> basically scale before you start hitting those issues. Um, you need to introduce some pretty cool security measures into that because obviously you've got this kind of open messaging system in the middle that if you can inject messages into that, you can do all sorts of nasty, horrible things to your application. So you have to make sure that whatever is going over that messaging system is, is secure, which can be quite complicated. As I say, you need to monitor the hell out of it because you've got all sorts of things all over the place. You need to monitor how long it's taking each function to work. You need to monitor how long messages are transiting for. You need to monitor how you used your 
resources are, so CPU memory on each of those things. So you've got many servers to monitor, so you're going to have to put in some kind of monitoring infrastructure. Um, and you have to be pretty careful with data synchronization because one of the things, one of the rules of this microservice approach is everything deals with its own view of the world. <coughs> a small part of that, but there are instances where you need to use data that somebody else owns. And the rule is that you can make a copy of that data because you've got access to all the messages that they've got access to. So if somebody creates a user account, you see that message potentially if you're interested in it and you can make a copy of it. But if it's not your data, if you don't own it, you can't change it. So you can make a copy of your data, but you must of somebody else's data, but you mustn't change it. So you also have to listen for updates. So when somebody updates their account, you have to listen for that as well. So there is a cost in terms of storage because you're storing data in multiple places. The storage is cheap, um, so it's not huge deal, but you've got to watch for things going out of sync, so you, you do have to put some extra code in to, to look out for things like that and potentially self-heal. So the big question is, does it work? So we've spent a year uh, creating a, a platform and a project uh, at Indigo to do this, and um, basically our first deployment is going to go live at some point in the next few months, so we're going to find out pretty soon whether it works or not. All the indications at this stage are that it's going to do what we needed to do, all those things that we said it can do, it does. Um, it's just going to be a case of working out the, working out the kinks um, to make sure we get what we've paid for. So that's it. That's me. That's a quick tour of what we can do and what we've done in terms of complexity uh, and scaling. So, what, uh, what monitoring tools are you using? Uh, we're using Zabbix at the moment, uh, open source monitoring platform, so we've built that into uh, absolutely everything. So, uh, Zabbix primarily is used to monitor servers, so you put an agent on the server and it pumps the information up into a database and it can do alerts and performance monitoring and all that kind of stuff. But essentially it will do monitoring of anything, so we've actually pushed into each of our microservices, each of our microservices uh, aggregates data on how it's performing, as in how many messages it's processing, how long it's taking to process those messages, and then sticks a monitoring reporting message onto the bus, which is then picked up by Zabbix, and produces those performance graphs on how each service is running. So that's it, the service level, at the bus level, and at the API level, so we can see where our bottlenecks are by looking at, well, that particular request type is taking too long, so which bit of it is taking too long, which means we can then look at either optimizing code, optimizing servers, or scaling servers to, to make that bit work better. So without that information in that kind of architecture, you'd be kind of screwed, sure. um, because you just wouldn't know where the problem was. So by putting that in from the ground up, it means that we've, we've got those the agent on the Linux server, does that turn out the same sort of message bus messaging? Was it? Uh, the agent on the actual server uses the standard Zabbix way, so it'll talk direct to the Zabbix server. It's only the services that are basically, they, they push the message onto the bus, and then we've got a, a Zabbix microservice that listens to the bus and collects all those things and puts them into the database. Okay. So we can do things like um, archiving and things in the same way that we can put an archiving service in uh, which will listen for every message that happens or every message of a certain type and just dump that into an archiving database and things like that. So because you've got that visibility, it's that kind of observer-consumer observer model, um, but at a grander scale. So uh, it gives us options to do all sorts of things. So that's quite important on things like um, uh, auditing, uh, depending on what application it is, you, if you've got a requirement to audit every action that happens in your system, well, you can do it because you just hide off all the messages. Can you explain a bit further what's in between the, uh, the front end and the application service in that, in that last one you explained? Would you excuse me? Uh, let me go back a couple of slides to the picture. So, so we're talking about this one. So you're talking okay. about... Yeah, what technologies are you using for that API layer and for the message bus? Right, message bus we're uh, implementing on Rabbit, 
Um, we chose Rabbit essentially because it's the predominant um, messaging system out there at the moment. There's loads of resources on it, it's open source. Yeah. It ticked all the boxes for us, it's scalability and clustering. So yeah, the so message bus runs on that. So have your support for that through? We haven't got support at the moment, but there is options for support on that. So um, again, that's one of the reasons why we choose these types of technologies. And so is that you know, we, we build the expertise, but we always like to have <laughs> them just in case. Um, the API layer at the moment, um, it, we've constructed a REST API, essentially. Um, so but is that running on something like Tomcat as well? Yeah, yeah. It's the same thing. It's uh, Spring. So we use Spring, Spring uh, Framework, uh, which creates that REST API for us. Um, and all it does is it, very, very thin because all it does is it takes the, the REST request, formats it into a JSON uh, message that just gets dumped onto the bus. And all Microsoft yeah. is to the API. It's still Microsoft is to um, all, all the API is Microsoft is to. So each Microsoft has a REST yeah. API to it, which is a Microsoft to itself. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, so the initial page load is done by a monolithic step, is it? Could be, or not. And then you've got. It depends. I mean, we're, this architecture is really about building a, uh, a service platform. Yeah. So um, it, it's not the website itself. The website here is in whatever technology. I mean, in, in the project we're working in at the moment, actually, it is a PHP website using a, a whatever framework it's built on um, and is relatively, you know, it's a standard, standard web development type approach, you, you know, it's standard PHP and all you're doing is instead of hitting the database for your data, you're making a REST call. Yeah, you just very it down by moving everything further yeah. down the same. Yeah, basically. So that thin, I mean, the idea, the project we're working on is to provide a service where multiple websites from other third parties would consume that service. Yeah. Um, so this is the bit that needs to be massively scalable because we will potentially have multiple websites which in their own right can be quite busy. So they've got their own scalability issues to worry about in terms of making sure they can service enough users on their side of things and then we've obviously got the scalability issue of being able to answer all of those requests. Now in the applications we're, we're doing the first client for it as well we're making sure that we cache things, and so the things that Rob was talking about, making sure you cache where you can. So this front end will cache what it knows to be relatively static information um, so that it doesn't have to ask the system all the time for it because obviously there is a cost incurred in that. So everybody has to be um, aware of those performance bottlenecks and issues and, and code around it as well. But it does say it does allow us to do all these other great things. Uh, is that static content the same front end service or static content is again it's front end issues front off. front end issue. So if they want to put that onto some kind of content delivery network or stuff, then that's up to the front end side of things. And yeah, absolutely. I mean that's <coughs> that's kind of things kind of key as well. Um, you know, some of the some of the bits that we'll drive from here have front-end data that will end up with a, an end user and yes absolutely it, it, it gets delivered from here but realistically probably a content delivery network is, is a viable option for that as well. Amazon Web Services don't have a message bus product, do they? I don't think they have a messaging no? system. No? Yeah. yeah. Um, Red Hat have a messaging uh, messaging tool, a cloud messaging system as well. There's quite a lot of them that do. Some of them uh, are proprietary. Um, some of them are built onto AMPQ as well. Um, but again, it's it's a cloud service. So it's, you know, here's here's our REST API for putting a message on, and you can get the message off at the other end with this REST API. That's how um, Red Hat do it. It's all via REST rather mm -hmm. than by uh, AMP direct. It, it does the same thing, it's, it's guaranteed message delivery effectively. So you put a message on, on onto the system and it's guaranteed to be delivered to somewhere at the other end. Um, so originally it was designed to um, basically guarantee and protect delivery of information across a flaky network. Um, so that's where NQ came from in, in the first instance.
Amazon Web Services, Amazon SQS, which is yeah. a simple queue system. Simple queue system. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so, if you want to move this between providers, how much uh, are you locked in? Say you build this on AWS and you see Rackspace has a better deal, you want to move it there. Is that easy to do, or it's not easy because it's it's a big system? So, right. but there's no there's no barrier to doing it because we're not using. In this instance, we're not using any of the proprietary cloud services, so we're not using any of Rackspace's services or Amazon services. Um, so as long as you do everything yourself based on a Linux distribution, then you could run that on Amazon, you could run it on Rackspace. Um, you could potentially divide your service layer up uh, uh, right. over multiple. Sure, yeah. Yeah. Potentially. As long as your message bus is available to yeah, the only thing you, you run into there is you massively increase your latency yeah. as soon as you work, work out of the, the local network. Mm. So you may well be able to distribute certain parts of it in that sense, as long as the latency is not going to kick you in the ass. Yeah. Um, so anything that requires um, an in some kind of interactive response needs to be localized within the same physical network. But if you've got processing that might need to be done uh, that requires a service that Amazon provides or something, then absolutely you could just extend your bus across onto the Amazon system, process it all there because, well, their utility model is cheaper, so um, you're, you've got automatic spinning up of your um, service, uh, service layer uh, that's elastic on Amazon because it just does it better, um, then yeah, absolutely pump those messages across there and, and let it deal with it and then it will all come back. Um, so as long as you don't lose complete communication between the two networks, um, you're pretty much good to go. Does the service layer blindly trust the message bus, or where, where does that...? Um... That comes down to the authentication system. We, so... we lay every single message is digitally signed um, and authenticated so that um, you know which website the request has come from. Um, you know that it's been processed by um, a service, and each answer is then signed by a service coming back. So every interaction. You just pull the bits onto the message. To... Yeah. yeah basically. Um, so it, it, it's it's fundamental. You can't have somebody inject onto that system um, a message that is invalid. It just would screw things badly. Jess, on the messages coming back from your service layer, mm -hmm. what sort of size and what limit have you found with the returning message? Um, we try and keep everything as small as possible yeah. for all obvious reasons. Um, we haven't really investigated the maximum size. Rabbit can send big messages, but then if you've got a data, a, a significant amount of data to shift, you're just going to break it up into multiple messages. Um, one of the things you do when you start to use this kind of thing, you start to introduce asynchronous processing in, you have to start thinking about asynchronous here. So you have to deliver your web page, but parts of that page may need to actually wait for an answer. So you, you may need to start using um, asynchronous JavaScript in your web pages to go, right, I'm going to ask for that bit of the page and I'm going to wait, but the rest of the page has been delivered and you can show some kind of interactive element to the user to say, Hang on, I'm just building that. Maybe rotation of GIF. I'll let that because the designers they do something <laughs> better than that. Yeah. But that's the idea. So you, you know, you, you introduce that asynchronicity, but it has to be pervasive. It has to go all the way to the front end to get the best performance out of it. Otherwise, you will have page slow page loads. Um, but you write that bit correctly, and you'll still get your really quick responses and really quick page turnarounds because this is doing its job properly and you've got all that scalability and you just, you just got to know what its limits are. Um, so, as I say, we've got from front to back, yeah, front to back to back, we're probably talking about 200 milliseconds in total in network latency, uh, which is, that's your network connections, your processing through the bus and everything. But it's all in the same rack though, isn't it? Yes, that's local network, so that's all within the same network infrastructure with the same provider. Ten gig or one um, I'd have to ask them. Um, I don't know specifically what it is. But the limit you do there is you, you reduce the number of results you return back. That's the way you reduce the size of that answer. Perhaps. So instead of, instead of loading a thousand results, you just load 
20 as well. Yeah. And then slightly yeah. bigger. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, and that's it. Paging, paging of results and asking for, for more information later or, um, you know, in its purest sense, you would ask, literally, you would just ask for an answer to, answer to a question and you wouldn't know how many answers you were going to get back. Um, and you, you'd wait until you had enough answers, which is where this becomes asynchronous. That is quite a difficult model to, to get your head around and quite difficult to actually deliver properly at the front end. So in our application, we've, we've made it deliver the answers that we need. So we know we're going to get one answer back, so we only wait for one answer. But there are situations where you would, you, you'd potentially get multiple answers back and you just wait until you've got enough. There's other instances where you may put a message onto the bus that asks a question and this service goes, oh well, to answer that question I need some information. So it chucks a message up onto the bus and waits for some answers back, formulates it all up, does its processing and then gives you your answer back. Obviously. <coughs> The more that that happens, the more complicated it gets. But you can see that you've got services that then can collaborate with each other to do things. So when this service does something for a request, this service over here might be going, oh yeah, well, I'm quite interested in that. I'm not answering anybody's questions at the moment, but I need that information. So it'll consume that message as well, do its thing. But then when somebody asks for that information, well, it's got it to hand because it's been capturing it along the way. So it can be really quite quite clever, and then obviously, as I said these services can be anything. You know that can be an, you know if one of these services could effectively just be an API into some other big system. So it will be answering and consuming information, and it could be going off to some other big system. So this really is a you know a transport system for integration, not just the code we write, but potentially code other people write. So is that the message bus resilient? Have you got multiple? Yes, clustered Rabbit. Um, so Rabbit's clustering is quite good. Um, there's a few issues with it that I'm not particularly a fan of. For example, um, when you set up a queue, uh, I mean, basically we've got a, an abstraction layer that does all the <coughs> you, you set up a queue for these things to listen on or a queue for these to send them on to. Where it gets created um, is where it stays. Yeah. And if it becomes a very busy queue, that server becomes very busy. And you might have too many busy queues on that server. So you, ideally I'd like to be able to migrate queues between Rabbit servers. And at the moment there's no facility to do that. So it's one of the problems we're going to have to solve is being able to migrate queues. And um, you can manage the one server goes down, it's got the message, messages on. Oh yeah, it's, it's, it's durable it's queues and durable process. messages. So when you send a message on, it's, the cluster takes care of distributing it across all the servers for you. We don't care about that because that's what Rabbit does. Yeah. Um, so so you know it's when it's been consumed and yeah. dropped it off. Yeah, the clustered version is free, is it? Rabbit, yeah. 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 We sounded quite clever, but we've done all this for the Alpha system, so we've sort of been through the same pain mm. as you've been through. Yeah. But we, we use IBM's MQ. Yeah. So, you know, Rabbit you know, sounds good. Yeah. Um, I mean, MQ, that kind of system's been around a long time. I mean, mm. this architecture, which Simon put me onto, that's uh, his fault. Uh, <laughs> it's, um, so, you know, it's been around a long time as well, but it, it's not it's not mainstream, it's not the way that everybody does things. It, it's, it's just slightly different because it is complicated. You know, there's no getting away from it. Scalability and resilience makes stuff complicated. You, you get to the point where your, your application has gone absolutely berserk and nuts and you've got to scale B. Um, this is the kind of stuff that you've got to got to deal with and you know in, in its own right it's a massive massive issue um, and that's before you even get anywhere near what you're actually putting in terms of code onto your boxes this is just about shipping information around and making that resilient your actual code has still got to be architected correctly it's still got to be performance tuned it's still got to be written in a sensible way so um, those two things have got to work together to be able to, to get this to work on. So it's a, it's a big, 
Any, any recommendations as far as cloud database scope? Don't use them. Right. Um, Is that you don't use them or, or they, they shouldn't be used? <laughs> we've chosen not to use it. Well, actually, we didn't choose not to use it. The platform we've been forced to use to deliver our first project doesn't have it. Right. So we've had to roll our own MySQL cluster. Now, MySQL cluster is an entirely another conversation that I can have with you because that's a nightmare as well. Um, but we've used Rackspace's Cloud MySQL and it's perfectly good. It uh, performs reasonably well. But as I said in the in the <coughs> at that point, you are completely blind. You've got no ability to tune it or configure it to do what you want. You've got no ability to really visualize what's going on with it. And that's fairly common with all of those kind of providers. It is very much, it's your date, you know, there's a database there and don't ask questions about how it's running. Um, and you've just got what you've got. So for example, uh, holding persistent uh, connections open to the database tends to not work very well because they will just get cut off at random points, uh, which is not great. Um, so you, you've got to make sure that what you're using to connect to those cloud databases is pretty solid. Um, Often getting data in and out of it is you know, loading up a big chunk of data into the cloud. Database models takes you know, yeah. a lot of resource, a lot of cost sometimes. Yeah, and to, to be honest, you know, we're not using a cloud database as such, but we're still using a cloud platform, so we, we do face those exact problems. I mean, um, in this particular instance, it's local, so we could literally ship around there and you know stuff a disk on kind of thing. But that's that's usually not the case. You usually don't have that kind of access. So you're absolutely right. The volumes of the data you've got to load in, if you have to start from a big data set, is significant as well. You've got to worry about things. Like is, there, is there not a problem with latency off the island? I would have, if there's a big application, I'd be putting it in London or. Um, this particular application has regulatory requirements to be here. Um, so, yes, you will have latency issues if you have to service a global market. And if we were, if this this particular platform will go international, but um, it's not, it's not going to be that massive. So, you can't, cash, be, you can't cash parts of it. You know. So, you know, it's tricky because of what it what it's doing is tricky as to what we can and can't do with it. Um, if we were deploying this for something that was truly international, that was servicing a global market, you're absolutely right. I would not host it here. Um, it would go into somewhere like Rackspace London, Rackspace US, or Amazon, or whatever. Um, I mean, with this kind of stuff as well, you've got the possibility of being able to connect multiple. Uh, data center jurisdictions for replication and things like that, so you may be able to do you know, do things like that, but obviously you've, you've got latency, big latency mm -hmm. issues, the European, shipping costs. The European side, latency to Jersey is probably Next reasonable. Year. Yeah, and J JT do have really good connections out to, to London and France and stuff like that, so um, in that sense we, we've got pretty good connectivity. Um, so. so when you said you had your MySQL database in, in the cloud, and the rest of the front end, the API, etc. Was that sitting in the same rack as the cloud database, or were they, you know, using different? You're using, you know, you have a rack in. Well, we don't have a rack. It's cloud. It's all cloud. It, yeah, but what about your front end? Where's your? All front? All it's all, all in. Oh, all it's all in. Yeah. We don't. We don't have. We don't deploy physical hardware ever. It's just not worth the effort. Um, so everything we do will be cloud hosted somewhere. Okay. Um, it just it's just not economical these days to, to do it that way unless unless you're talking about a specific requirement for that particular project or that client, which generally comes down to regulations and where data is held. Um, so in this instance, if we didn't have a cloud platform to to use, we would have had to build physical servers, yeah. which probably would have killed the project because it's just too costly and then we've got to worry about hardware maintenance and the cost of okay. the building and that kind of stuff. So there's a, there's a local JT cloud? Yep. Yeah. yeah, we didn't know that either. <laughs>